Chapter thirty five of Joan Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. When after a long and tedious voyage over a sea as flat as a plate and unflawed by a single cooling drift of air the steamboat was made fast to the end of the long iron pier which juts out from the flat low coast of coney island its passengers rose en masse and crowded toward the gangways joan and fowey attempting to hang back until the crowd had thinned out sufficiently to enable them to go ashore in comfort were caught in the swirl of it and swept along willy-nilly once on the pierhead the multitude had more elbow-room and spread out the main body streaming headlong shorewards keen set for the delights promised by the two great amusement parks which had grown up in the heart of that frontier settlement of gin mills dance halls side shows eating houses and dives unspeakable joan and fowey followed more at their leisure constraint and silence between them like a wall the girl was deeply disappointed with the expedition as far as it had gone doubting whether anything better would follow and still laboring under that unaccountable depression which had settled down upon her spirits at sight of quard on the new bedford boat fowey no less disgusted was puzzled by his companion's attitude at once tolerant and aloof keenly watchful for an opening through which to pursue his conquest and wondering how it would end if she were simply bent on tantalizing him again for her own amusement he swore angrily but inaudibly near the shore end of the pier they delayed to watch the antics of the hundreds of bathers churning the shallows in front of huge and hideous bathing establishments in countless numbers they dotted the sea like flies and darkened the sun-baked unclean sands into which their feet had trodden the wreckage of ten thousand lunches fowey said something inexpressibly cynical about the resemblance of the scene below to a congregation of bacilli crawling upon a slide beneath a microscope joan heard without response either vocal or mental she resented bitterly the superior attitude adopted by her companion for her part she would have asked nothing better than to mingle with the throng and taste those crude pleasures so dear to its simple heart and had she but dared admit it to her own but she had fowey to live up to very heartily she regretted the impulse which had dictated her invitation she had been far happier alone though it would have been strange had she been suffered to remain long alone by the time they left the pier the evening was so far advanced that the myriad lights of the tawdry town were flashing into being they debouched into a roaring mob which filled the wide avenue from curb to curb packed so densely though in constant motion that trolley cars and automobiles forced a way through it only at a snail's pace and with great difficulty encouraged by the excessive heat which rendered town intolerable to all who had the means to escape it the weekend swarming had begun in all sincerity in spite of the terrific congestion which already obtained in all the streets and avenues and beaches piers amusement parks catchpenny shows saloons and restaurants scarcely a minute passed without the arrival at some one of the trolley terminals of a car packed to the guards with more visitors a good-natured if rowdy mob for the most part with only a minimum element of the downright vicious in its composition it was none the less bent on amusement in its cheapest form that is to say at somebody else's expense it gathered thickest round the places of free entertainment where acrobats performed on open-air stages or crawled upon high invisible wires or where slides were supplied gratis for public diversion grinning always but howling with delight when treated to real misadventure as when some girl negotiating a bamboo slide upon a grass mat 
her skirts wrapped tight about her would lose balance and shoot headlong sprawling to the level the greater the exposure the greater the diversion nor was fowey permitted to escape unteased his conspicuous clothing and the broad black ribbons dangling from his horn-rimmed glasses were too tempting to be resisted once his panama was smashed down over his eyes and his glasses were so frequently jerked by their moorings from his nose that he was fain at length to pocket them and poke owlishly along at joan's guidance dazzled to blindness by those ten million glaring bulbs which lifted up tier upon tier against the blank purple skies deafened by an indescribable cacophony of bands organs bells horns human tongues incessantly clattering suffering acutely from the collective heat of the multitude added to that of the still and muggy night buffeted and borne hither and yon at the will of the mass they contrived in the end to engage an open horse-drawn vehicle of the type colloquially known in those days as low-neck hack and ordered themselves driven to the manhattan beach hotel when presently they had gained the darkling peace of a long road between marshlands fowey resumed with his glasses his hateful cynicism that was considerable treat all right he said pensively glad you liked it joan replied with a curtness of chagrin we'll go back and have some more after dinner he suggested thanks i've had plenty no but really he insisted we haven't seen half of it oh shut up her anger was real and when he would have mollified the girl with soft words and an arm that sought to steal round her waist she repeated her injunction with added coarseness and struck his hand away with a force that he felt in spite of this he schooled himself to patience dinner served perfunctorily by a weary waiter and consumed upon the veranda of the hotel at a table the best they could command far removed from the comparative coolness and ease of those beside the railing did little if anything to modify joan's temper she who had set out believing herself the happiest of mortals to spend an evening of real enjoyment felt utterly wretched and forlorn moment by moment her distaste for fowey was gaining strength she was put to it to listen to his bragging and to make response civilly she did not relish her food her company or her surroundings and in utter ennui tried to stimulate herself with her favorite brand of sweet champagne insisting on another bottle when they had emptied one between them it served only to stimulate a fictitious gaiety in her one swift to wane for all this she was reluctant to contemplate going home anything were preferable to that at least until she could feel reasonably sure of finding hattie abed and asleep they finished their meal at an hour too late to make it worth while to patronize one of the open-air entertainments with which she had promised herself diversion and since she would neither go home nor at fowey's mischievous suggestion return to coney island they moved to another table nearer the railing and whiled away one more hour listening to the band music over their cigarettes and the curves toward eleven o'clock joan suddenly announced that she was sick of it all and ready to go fowey revived his preference for a motor-car and got his way against scanty opposition in a saner humour joan would have stuck to her original plan as it was she accepted the motor ride with neither gratitude nor graciousness curiously enough once established in the car her hat off the swift rush of night air cooling her moist brows her head resting back against the cushions she permitted fowey to repeat his ardent love-making which had made their previous ride together memorable her dislike of him was no less thorough paced but had passed from an active to a passive stage she was at once too indifferent to resist him and so bored that she welcomed anything that promised excitement she suffered his kisses 
confident in her power to control him and drew a certain satisfaction from reminding him now and again forcibly that there were limits to her toleration but for the most part she lay in his arms in passive languor her eyes half closed and tried to forget him or rather to believe him someone else one whose embraces she could have welcomed when they came to lighted streets she bade fowey behave and would not permit him even so slight a lapse from decorum as that of holding hands she sat up rearranging the disorder of her hair adjusted her hat surreptitiously restored the brilliance of her lips with a stick of rouge the man drew back sullenly into his corner fuming at her door dismissing the car he followed her up to the stoop joe he began angrily she turned back from using her latch key with a wondering childlike stare yes hubert she inquired with hidden malice you're not you're not going to send me off like this why not she demanded with fine assumption of simplicity it's awful late fowey seized her wrist now listen to me joan broke his grasp with little or no effort silly boy she said do you really want to come in and visit a while before you say good-night her look was false with a winning softness fowey stammered you you know then come along she said with a laugh and turning fled lightly before him up the darkened stairway she had opened the door to the tiny private hallway of the flat when he overtook her panting she paused with a warning finger to her lips Shh, she warned don't wake caddy he swore viciously discountenanced and she laughed and leaving the door wide went on into the small sitting dining room meanly exulting in the discomfiture she had planned knowing quite well that he had either forgotten hattie or believed her to be spending this weekend out of town as before in the act of lighting the gas she heard the door close and saw fowey come white and shaken into the room hush she said gaily i'll make sure she isn't awake removing her hat she passed on into the adjoining bedroom and stopped short with a sensation of sinking dismay the room was empty the bed she shared with hattie untouched so much was visible in the faint light entering through windows that opened on a well wondering joan struck a light its first glimmer revealed to her the fact that hattie's trunk was gone the flare of the gas jet disclosed greater changes in the aspect of the room due to the disappearance of hattie's toilet articles and knick-knacks hattie had left bag and baggage had gone for good but why had she discovered joan's treachery or what had happened and in her surprise and perplexity the girl was conscious anew of that sense of loneliness she had been afraid to return to the one whom she had betrayed so lightly but now she was afraid to be without her going back to the adjoining room she found fowey standing beside the table and with a slight smile examining a sheet of paper i found this lying here he announced handing it over didn't realize it was anything until i'd read half of it his smile was again confident bright with premature pride of conquest but joan didn't heed it she was reading rapidly what had been written swiftly and in a sprawling hand upon the half-sheet of note-paper by rights i ought to stay until you come back whenever you have the cheek to and tell you what i think of you i saw b e this evening and he told me all about it but i want never to see you again the rent's paid up till next wednesday then you can stick or get out i don't care which and i wish you joy of your bargain h m you've been scrapping with hattie eh joan heard fowey say in an amused voice without answering she let the sheet of paper fall to the table and stood with head bowed in thought suffering acutely the humiliation inspired by hattie's contemptuous dismissal what was the trouble fowey pursued 
not that i'm sorry oh nothing much joan interrupted we just had a difference of opinion and she had to fly off the handle like this it doesn't matter it matters to me fowey announced significantly now joan looked up for the first time appreciating her position oh she said blankly fowey was advancing with extended arms she raised a hand to fend him off don't she begged please don't i can't you must go now of course i'm sorry good night he paused and she saw his face pale and working with passion his small eyes blazing behind their thick lenses his hands clenched by his sides but not tightly the fingers twitching nervously his whole body trembling and shaken beyond control she was conscious of an incongruous unnatural inexplicable feeling of pity for him please be a good boy she pleaded and go away no i'm damned if i do you ask me up here i know now just to tease me but that's no good i won't go he advanced another pace his tone and manner changing oh joan joan he begged don't treat me so cruelly you know i'm mad about you doesn't that mean anything to you more than a chance to torment me my god what kind of a woman are you i can't stand this flesh and blood couldn't i'm only human all this week i've kept away from you simply because i realized what you were what am i joan cut in quickly fowey choked again with a gesture of impotent exasperation you he almost shouted you're the woman i love and who's driving me mad mad i tell you hubert you mean that you really love me you know i do you know i'm crazy about you haven't you seen it from the first hesitating joan experienced a sense of one in deep waters there was a sound as that of distant surf in her ears all through her body pulses were throbbing madly she struggled still a little instinctively but fowey advantaged himself of that instant of indecision he held her in his arms now her face was stinging beneath his kisses almost unconsciously she lifted her arms and clasped them round his neck drawing his face to hers you poor kid she murmured fondly her eyes closed you poor kid End of chapter 35。Chapter 36 of Joan Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. The s l i p p e r b o x recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Without knowing how she had come there, Joan found herself standing beside the outer doorway in the narrow hall, one hand. hugging about her the kimono she must have snatched up by instinct while yet not fully wakened the other hand fumbling with the lock sleep clouding her brain like a fog fatigue weighting her eyelids and chaining her limbs panic hammering in her bosom overhead the doorbell was ringing imperatively without interruption even as it must have been ringing for many minutes before she was consciously awake dimly she felt that this alarm by night must portend something strange and terrible and still she held her hand wondering what could it be not quard for she had seen him leave new york never marbridge that were unthinkable hattie morrison perhaps and that man the bell ground on implacably at length she found courage to adjust the chain bolt and open the door to the limit permitted by that guard in the outer hallway a gas jet burned turned low diffusing just enough illumination to show her the figure somehow indefinitely familiar in spite of its style of a man in a chauffeur's uniform a young and wiry man clothed in khaki coat and breeches and leather leggings and wearing a cap with visor shadowing heavily his narrow sharp-featured countenance as the door opened he removed his finger from the bell-push and drove home recognition with his voice miss thursby live here i got a message for her 
joan gasped butch it's me all right her brother admitted crisply in his well-remembered tone of irony you certainly are one sincere little sleeper i've been ringing here how did you get in rang up the janitor if that matters listen you better hustle into your clothes quick so you can if you want to get home in time to say good-bye to the old woman mother joan shrilled what what's the matter dying butch told her briefly and without emotion she said she wanted to see you so get a move on my car's waitin and i dassent leave it alone hustle you understand yes yes joan promised with a sob i'll hurry butch see you do then the boy swung about smartly and disappeared down the well of the stairway joan closed the door and leaned against it panting suppose he had wanted to come in for the moment this was her sole coherent thought then rousing she crept stealthily back to the darkened bedroom gathered up her clothing with infinite precautions against noise and returned to the sitting-room to dress in feverish haste there was an open taxicab waiting in front of the door as she came out butch bent over and cranked the motor straightening up he waved her curtly into the body of the car jump in and shut the door he ordered briefly climbing into the driver's seat but butch don't you hear me get in and shut that door we got no time to waste chin in here abashed and frightened the girl obeyed immediately butch had the cab in motion tearing eastward at lawless speed through streets whose long ranks of yawning windows seen fugitively in the formless dusk of early morning seemed to look down leering as if informed with terrible intelligence she shut out the sight of them with hands that covered her face until the swift rush of cool air steadied and sobered her so that she grew calmer in the knowledge that in veritable fact and this was all that really mattered nobody knew then sitting up she composed herself and with deft fingers completed the adjustment of her garments by the time she had finished her toilet aided by a small mirror inset between the forward windows butch was stopping the cab before the east seventy-sixth street tenement bending back he unlatched the door and swung it open you go on up he ordered i'll be around before long gotta run this machine back to the garage joan stepped quickly to the sidewalk and shut the door all right she responded and added almost timidly avoiding her brother's eyes thank you butch he grunted unintelligibly and as joan moved up the stoop threw in the power again and drew swiftly away down the street for an instant joan held back in the vestibule sickened to recognize anew the home of dirt and squalor she had fled a long lifetime since it seemed and struggling with almost invincible repugnance for the ordeal awaiting her at the head of those five weary flights then more through instinct than of her will her finger pressed the call button beneath the thursby letter-box the latch clicked she pushed the door open moved reluctantly into the shadows and addressed herself wearily to the stairs inhaling with a keen physical disgust the heavy and malodorous atmosphere in which her youth had been shaped toward womanhood as the dining-room door admitted her she checked again almost tempted to question the soundness of those faculties which insisted that more than a year had passed rather than an hour or two since she had left that mean and sordid place above the dining-table blazed and wheezed a single gas jet whose ragged bluish flame was yet sufficiently strong to turn to the color of night the dull dawn-light outside the air-shaft windows it revealed to her not a single article of furniture other than as memory placed it and showed her seated on the far side of the table her father lifting a heavy and sullen face from the notebook between his soiled fat fingers that inevitable sheaf of dope lying at his elbow there was no sort of greeting in proper sense between these two for a little neither spoke joan hesitated with shoulders against the panels of the door 
in an attitude instinctively defiant and defensive thursby looked her up and down a luring sneer marking his recognition of his daughter's finery suddenly explosively she found her tongue how's ma thursby jerked a thumb in the direction of the bedrooms she died an hour ago he said slowly just after ed went to find you edna's in there joan made a gesture of horror my god she said throatily and turned away a moment later loud cries of lamentation ringing through the flat testified that she had found her sister End of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. with peculiar irony the passing of that pallid vague and ineffectual character mrs thursby proved the signal for the dissolution of the family which denying her both respect and affection during her life had none the less lost in losing her its sole motive or excuse for unity the return from the cemetery was accomplished toward noon of a july day whose heavily overcast sky seemed only to act as a blanket over the city compressing its heated and humid atmosphere until the least exertion was to be indulged in only at the cost of saturated clothing the four were crowded in common misery within a shabby stuffy undertaker's growler thursby occupied the back seat with his eldest daughter notwithstanding the fact that since apprising her of her mother's death the morning of her return he had addressed no word to her directly he sat now with fat and mottled hands resting on his knees his waistcoat unbuttoned exposing soiled linen his dull and heavy gaze steadfastly directed through the window opposite him on the forward seat edna wept silently and incessantly into a black-bordered handkerchief butch beside her looked serious and depressed in a suit of black clothing borrowed for the occasion nobody spoke from the time they re-entered the carriage after the burial until they left it joan huddled herself into her corner putting all possible space between herself and her father a sense of lassitude was heavy upon her she meditated vaguely on the strangeness of life its inscrutable riddle the enigma of its brief and feverish transit from black oblivion through light to black oblivion but the problem only wearied her she dropped it from time to time and tried to think of other things as a rule this resulted in her speculations centering about butch the boy mystified her awed her a little with a suggestion of spirit and strength character and intelligence conveyed by a forceful yet unassuming manner it was a new manner strangely developed in the year that spaced her knowledge of him only to be explained by his sudden determination to go seriously to work and make something of himself and the motive for that remained inexplicable and would ever as far as concerned joan for the personal reticence that had always sealed his cynical mouth was more than ever characteristic of the boy to-day and the sympathy which once had existed between himself and joan was become a thing of yesterday and as if it had never been his attitude toward her was touched with just a colour of contempt almost too faint to be resented she shrank from it feeling that he saw through her shallowness that he knew her not as marbridge knew her perhaps or as billy salute but thoroughly and intimately and far better than she would ever know herself she knew now through edna that within the last twelve month butch had learned his trade of chauffeur and pursued it with such diligence that aside from being the main support of the family which she had deserted he was half owner of his taxicab and in a way to acquire an interest in a small garage when the carriage stopped the father was the first to alight with no word or look for either of his daughters and only a semi-articulate growl for butch 
to the effect that they'd see one another again at dinner he pulled his rusty derby well forward over his haggard haunted eyes thrust his hands deep into trouser pockets and slouched ponderously away in the direction of his newsstand before he turned the avenue corner joan looking after him while she waited for butch to settle with the driver saw thursby produce his packet of dope and moistening a thumb began to con it as he plodded on so pursuing his passion to the end he passed forever from her life yet never altogether from her memory in which as time matured the girl his inscrutable personality assumed the character of a symbol of aborted destiny what he had been whence he had sprung what he might have become she never learned then preceded by edna followed by butch she climbed for the last time those weary stairs arrived in the flat butch shut himself into his room to change to working clothes he could not afford to waste an afternoon he said joan and edna sat down in the dark and dismal dining-room conferring in hushed voices until he rejoined them he came forth presently the inevitable cigarette drooping from his thin hard lips and sat down his spare wiry body looking uncommonly well set up and capable in the chauffeur's livery after a little hesitation joan mustered up courage to say her say if with something nearly approaching appeal in the way that she addressed this taciturn and self-sufficient man who had replaced her loaferish brother i've been telling edna she said that i'm going to take care of her from now on that's so butch exhaled twin jets of smoke from his nostrils how he inquired without prejudice well she's coming to live with me where i don't know i'm leaving where you found me by the way how did you know where to look for me butch seen you one day when you was living in the astoria inn there's a dairy lunch on the ground floor where i generally eat after that i kept an eye on you oh said joan thoughtfully wondering how much that eye had seen of the brief but lurid existence she had led before coming partially to her senses and moving to share hattie morrison's lodgings well i'll find a good place and edna can stay with me and act as my maid until she's old enough to find something to do for herself on the stage eh i guess so i'm getting on you know chances are i could give her a boost butch shook his head nothing doing why he was unmoved by the flash of hostility in joan's manner i guess he said after a deliberate pause we don't have to go into that anyway i got other plans for edna she's going to the country upstate to spend the summer on a farm family of a fellow i know after that if she's strong enough she can come back and keep house for me if she wants to or go to work any way she chooses that's not my business only understand me she isn't going to go into the chorus until she's old enough to know what she's doing and strong enough to stand the racket that's settled rising he jerked the stub of his cigarette through the air shaft window and slowly drew on his gauntlets you do what packin you want a kid he advised edna before three o'clock this afternoon i'll be back for you then your train leaves at four you'll travel along with the mother of this friend of mine mrs simmons her name is as he had said the matter was settled joan conceded the point without bickering with indeed a feeling of mean relief moreover she was afraid of butch the flat in fiftieth street had gained associations insufferably hateful she returned to it only long enough to pack up and move out incidentally she found read and destroyed without answering a note from fowey suggesting an assignation her paradoxical dislike for the man had deepened into detestation she both hoped and intended never to see him again she moved before nightfall leaving no address and established herself in an inexpensive but reputable boarding establishment little frequented by the class of theatrical people with which she was acquainted 
and where repetition of her escapade was impossible on the third day following she began rehearsing privately with gloucester and threw into the work all she could muster of strength patience and intelligence leaving herself at the end of each day's work too exhausted in mind and body to indulge in any of the pleasures to which her tastes inclined Fowey, unable to trace her and seeing nothing of the girl in those restaurants and places of amusement she had been wont to frequent in time gave up the chase and before the first presentation of mrs mixer the newspaper supplied joan with the news of his clandestine marriage and subsequent flight to europe with a widow whose fortune doubtless promised compensation for the fact that she had a son nearly as old as her latest husband End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. the rehearsals of tomorrow's people were arranged to begin on the twenty-third day of september and since all the important roles had been filled before he left town and wilbrow whom he could trust had charge of all other details matthias delayed his homecoming until the twenty-second not until the twentieth did he emerge from the wilderness up back of the allagash country into the comparative civilization of moosehead lake in eight weeks he had not written a line received a letter or read a newspaper but as he telegraphed helena from the mount kineo house he was so healthy that he was ashamed of it the day letter telegram she sent in reply was delivered on the train its news though condensed was reassuring venetia was well and her boy developing into a famous ruffian the two were making a visit at tanglewood and on the return of marbridge from his summer in europe would move back to new york where venetia was to reassume charge of his town house thus satisfied as to the welfare of the woman he loved matthias gave himself up completely to the production of his play and through the following four weeks lived in the theatre by day dreamed of it by night thought talked and wrote only in its singular terminology few facts unconnected with his own play penetrated his understanding in all that period but dining with wilbrow one night at the general table in the players he overheard gloucester railing bitterly at the ill fortune which had induced him to pledge himself to stage a modern satirical comedy for arlington and to train for the leading part a raw and almost inexperienced stage-struck girl he detailed his trials in vivid phrases as far as i know she's never played in anything except a bum vaudeville sketch and i had hell's own time making her fit to play that and yet she's got the ineffable nerve to keep picking at my way of doing things on the general ground that it ain't tom wilbrow's seems he had the privilege of rehearsing her for a five-side part in that punk show of jack matthias that went to pieces out on the coast last summer if wilbrow wasn't listening with all his ears over there i'd tell you what i said to the young woman the last time she threw him in my face what oh nobody you ever heard of calls herself thursday joan thursday of course i rowed with arlington about her but he only shrugged and grinned and said she had to play it and i'd got to make her play it offered to bet me a thousand over and above my fees i couldn't do it sure i took him up why not i'll make her act it yet i could make a casino chorus boy act human if i wasn't so squeamish oh marbridge one of his discoveries i saw him handing her gently into that big brazen touring car of his in front of rector's night before last fragile's the word handle with care wilbrow interrogated supplied the context arlington had bought up through a third party mrs cardrow's interest in mrs mixer 
advising her to sell out because the play had already scored one failure and promising her another play in which she would stand better chance to win new york audiences this was an old comedy from the french revamped and was even then being rehearsed with a scrub company and a scratch outfit of scenery the production to be made on the same night that mrs mixer was to tempt fate with joan thursday the designated date being the twenty fifth of october a wednesday matthias promptly dismissed the matter from his mind he speculated a little hazily about marbridge and his constitutional inability to understand that gentleman felt more than ever sorry for venetia and wondered how much longer she would stand it all and plunged again into his preoccupation tomorrow's people was announced for production on monday october the twenty third but after the dress rehearsal on sunday certain changes recommended themselves as advisable to the judgment of the author who persuaded the management to postpone the opening night until wednesday at ten minutes to twelve on that night the final curtain fell upon a successful representation an audience in its wraps blocked the aisles until after midnight applauding and demanding the author who however was not in the theatre he had in fact not been near it since the curtain falling on the first act had persuaded him of the general friendliness of an audience and the competency of the company this culmination of a nerve-racking strain which had endured without respite for over a month found him without courage to await the verdict he took to the streets and walked himself weary in vain effort to refrain from circling back toward the building whose walls housed his fate at length in desperation hoping to distract his thoughts from the supreme issue he purchased a ticket of admission to another theatre above whose entrance blazed the announcement mrs mixer and stationed himself at the back of the orchestra to witness the last part of the performance he saw the self-confidence of gloucester supremely justified the satiric farce marched steadily scene by scene to a success that was to keep it on broadway through the winter and make the name of joan thursday a household word throughout the union her personal success was as unquestionable as her beauty she played with grace vivacity charm and distinction and only to the initiate of the theatre was it apparent that gloucester had found in her the perfect medium for the transmission of his art matthias could see in company with a few of the more discriminating and stage-wise that she employed not a gesture intonation or bit of business which had not originated with gloucester she brought to her role on her part nothing but beauty and an unshakable self-confidence so thoroughly ingrained that it escaped suggesting self-consciousness the triumph was rightly first gloucester's then the play's but the public acclaimed the actress and the one acidulated critic who hailed her the following morning as at last the perfect human kinetophone record was listened to by none least of all by the subject of his sarcasm marbridge in a stage box led the applause at the conclusion of each act and at the end of the play arlington came in person before the curtain leading by the hand the gracefully reluctant joan and in a few suave sentences thanked the audience for its appreciation and a beneficent providence for granting him this opportunity of fixing a new star in the theatrical firmament the name of this little girl he promised bowing to joan would appear in letters of fire over the theatre the next night pausing in the lobby to light a cigarette before leaving matthias overheard one of arlington's lieutenants confiding to another the news of the ruinous failure of the third initial production of that night half an hour later he met wilbrow by appointment in a quiet non-theatrical club and received from him confirmation of rumours which had already reached him of his own triumph with tomorrow's people you're a made man now wilbrow told him with sincere good will and some little honest envy by to-morrow morning the pack will be at your heels yapping for a chance to put on every old script in your trunk i suppose so 
matthias nodded soberly but there's one comfort about that wilbrow pursued cheerfully whatever the temptation you won't give him anything but sound sane workmanlike stuff you've proved yourself one of the two or three at most playwrights in this country who are able to think and to make an audience think without losing sight of the fact that in the last analysis the play's the thing we've got plenty of authors nowadays who can turn out first chop melodrama and we've got a respectable percentage of them who write plays so full of honest and intelligent thought that it gives the average manager a headache to look at the script but the men who can give us the sort of drama that not only makes you think but holds you on the front edge of your seat waiting to see what's coming next well they're few and far between and you're one of em and i'm proud to have had a hand in putting you before the public you've got nothing on me there matthias grinned i'm proud you had and if i can get my own way after this you don't need to join the i should worries on account of that you'll be the only man who will ever produce one of my plays between one o'clock and two they parted matthias trudged home completely fagged in body but with a buoyant heart to sustain him venetia would be glad for him he was ascending the steps of number two eighty nine when a heavy touring car coming from the direction of long acre square swung into the curb and stopped latchkey in hand matthias paused and looked back in some little surprise the lodgers of madame de prat were a motley lot but as far as he knew none of them were of the class that maintains expensive automobiles but this car upon inspection proved to be tenanted by the chauffeur alone who leaving the motor purring jumped smartly from his seat and ran up the steps i beg your pardon sir he said touching his cap but i'm looking for a gentleman named matthias i am mr matthias thank you sir i've been sent to fetch you it's um er, important i fancy the man added eyeing matthias curiously you've been sent to fetch me but who sent you my employer sir mr marbridge marbridge matthias echoed startled without definite decision he turned and ran down the steps in company with the chauffeur venetia in need of him perhaps what's happened he demanded is is mrs marbridge if you'll just get in sir the man replied i'll tell you as much as i know on the way and i'll save time he opened the door of the tonneau but matthias turned from it walked round the car and climbed into the seat beside the drivers with a nod of satisfaction the chauffeur joined him threw in the power and deftly swung the ponderous vehicle about well matthias asked as the machine shot across town beg pardon sir the man replied after a moment but i'd rather not say anything if it's all the same to you it isn't matthias insisted curtly i'm not on sufficiently friendly terms with mr marbridge for him to send for me without explanation yes sir but you see part of my job is to keep my mouth shut i'm afraid i shall have to ask you to forget that duty to some extent or else stop the car and let me out very good sir i don't suppose i can do any harm telling what little i know after supper to-night mr marbridge told me to take the car to the garage and not to expect a call for it until some time to-morrow morning but when i got there he was already wanting me to, on the telephone he said there'd been an accident and told me to find mr arlington first and then you and ask you to come immediately but why me matthias asked more of himself than of the driver he didn't say sir did he state what sort of an accident no sir you found mr arlington no sir he wasn't in when i asked at his hotel but i left a message before coming on for you matthias sat up with a start instead of turning up broadway the man was steering his car straight across longacre square before he had time to comment on this fact they were speeding on towards sixth avenue look here he cried you're not taking me to mr marbridge's home no sir but mr marbridge hadn't got home when he telephoned me sir where is he then 
we'll be there in a minute sir an apartment house on madison avenue oh said matthias thoughtfully was mr marbridge uh, alone when you left him tonight i'd rather not say sir if you don't mind troubled by an inkling of the disaster matthias composed himself to patience turning south on fifth avenue the car passed thirty-fourth street before swinging eastward again it stopped eventually in the side street just short of the corner of madison avenue before a private entrance to a ground-floor apartment such as physicians prefer but matthias could discern no physician's nameplate upon the door at which his guide knocked or in either of the flanking windows opening the door disclosed a panelled entry tenanted by a white-lipped woman in the black-and-white uniform of a lady's maid her frightened eyes examined matthias apprehensively as he entered followed by the chauffeur this last demanded briefly dr ben the maid assented with a nervous nod ten minutes ago about he's with the lady now lady the chauffeur echoed but i thought it was mr marbridge i mean the other lady the maid explained the one what done the shootin when mr marbridge got the gun away from her he locked her up in the bathroom and then she had hysterics the doctor's trying to make her hush so she won't disturb the other tenants but you can hear yourself how she's carrying on in a pause that followed matthias was conscious of the sound of high-pitched and incessant laughter slightly muffled emanating from some distant part of the flat he asked abruptly where is mr marbridge the maid started and hesitated looking to the chauffeur this is mr matthias that one explained mr marbridge sent for him oh yes excuse me sir this way if you please opening a door on the right the woman permitted matthias to pass through then closed it he found himself in a dining-room of moderate proportions and handsomely furnished little of it was visible however outside the radius of illumination cast by an electric dome which depending from the middle of the ceiling focused its rays upon a small round dining-table of mahogany this table was quite bare save for a massive decanter of cut glass standing at the edge of a puddle of spilt liquor as if an uncertain hand had attempted to pour a drink near it lay a broken goblet on the farther side of the table a woman with young and slender figure stood in a pose of arrested action holding a goblet half full of brandy and water her features were but indistinctly suggested in the penumbra of the dome but beneath this her bare arms and shoulders rising out of an elaborate evening gown shone with a soft warm lustre matthias remembered that gown joan thursday had worn it in the last act of mrs mixer but she neither moved nor spoke and for the time being he paid her no further heed giving his attention entirely to marbridge sitting low in a deeply upholstered wing chair out of place in the dining-room and evidently dragged in for the emergency marbridge breathed heavily chin on his chest his coarse mouth ajar his face ghastly with a stricken pallor his feet sprawled uncouthly the dress coat and waistcoat he had worn lay in a heap on the floor near the chair and both shirt and undershirt had been ripped and cut away from his right shoulder exposing his swarthy and hairy bosom and a sort of temporary bandage which like his linen was darkly stained closed when matthias entered his eyes opened almost instantly and fixed upon the man a heavy and lacklustre stare which at first failed to indicate recognition matthias heard himself crying out in a voice of horror good god marbridge how did this happen the man stirred grunted with pain and made a deprecatory gesture with his left hand need yell he said thickly i've been shot done for his gaze shifted heavily to the woman with effort he enunciated one word more drink as though by that monosyllable freed from an enchaining spell joan started moved quickly to his side and held the goblet to his lips he drank noisily gulping and slobbering overflowing at either corner of his mouth the liquor dripped 
twin streams upon his naked bosom mechanically matthias put his hat down on the table he experienced an incredulous sensation as though he were struggling to cast off the terror and oppression of some particularly vivid and coherent nightmare from the farther room that noise persisted of monotonous and awful laughter marbridge ceased to swallow and grunted joan removed the glass and drew away without looking at matthias at a cost of considerable will-power apparently the wounded man collected himself and levelled at matthias his lowering but now less dull regard oh it's you is it he said ungraciously well you'll do at a pinch i wanted arlington but you if he couldn't be found well said matthias stupidly i'm here the doctor's seen you i suppose yes did what he could for me no use wasting effort it's my cue to exit oh come it's not as bad as that the hell it ain't the doctor knows i know not that it matters it was coming to me and i got it where's the doctor matthias insisted why isn't he attending you now he's in the other room trying to silence that crazy woman she plugged me and went into hysterics who nella codrow had the devil of a time with her before doctor came trying to keep her from rushing out and giving herself up all this in the papers but all right now we'll hush it up then that's what you want of me wait marbridge grunted where's that girl joan moved back to his side what can i do she said and these were all the words matthias heard her utter from first to last of that business marbridge nodded at her with a curling lip you can get out she turned sharply and left the room banging the door that's the kind she is marbridge commented you were lucky to get rid of her as easy as you did give me more brandy will you like a good fellow and be stingy with the water i've got to hold out a couple of hours more matthias served him i presume venetia knows nothing about this yet having drunk marbridge shook his head not yet now listen you guessed it i want you to help hush this up for venetia's sake rotten mess do no good if it gets in the papers only humiliation for her will you what is it you want me to do help me home and keep your mouth shut you see this is my place i've had it for years very handy private entrance all that nella used to meet me here that's how she came to have a key i'd forgotten well i got tired of her and she couldn't act and arlington was sore about that so we planned to get rid of her i guess you must have heard it was a dirty business all round and to-night when her play went to pieces just as we'd planned it should she saw how she'd been built and lost her head came here let herself in quietly without the maids hearing her and shot me when i came in with joan i managed to get the gun away before she could turn it on herself and locked her up then hysterics well i'm finished i asked for it and got it no no remorse bunk no deathbed repentance nothing like that but i realize i've been a pretty rotten proposition first and last never mind what i'm getting as this nobody need suffer but me that's where you come in for venetia's sake you and arlington and the doctor can cover it all up between you ollie can quiet that girl joan and the doctor's all right he'll want a pretty stiff check to fix the undertaker and that's all right too then you've got to scare nella cadra so she won't give herself away and buy my chauffeur and that maid out there sarah but first off you'll have to help doctor get me home and in bed i'm the sort that's got to die in the house his chin dropped again well 
i guess it's a good job at that he shivered the hall door opened and arlington entered followed by a lean man with worried eyes who proved to be the doctor End of chapter 38chapter thirty nine of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this liverbox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard shortly before seven o'clock that same morning a limousine car pulled up quietly just short of the corner of madison avenue and its occupant with a word on alighting to his driver addressed himself briskly to the door of the ground floor flat he was a handsome well-dressed well set up and well-nourished animal of something more than middle age a fact which the pitilessly clear light of early morning betrayed discovering lines and hollows in his clean-shaven countenance which would ordinarily have escaped notice but he passed that time of life when he could suffer a sleepless night of anxiety without visibly paying for it his intention to announce himself by ringing the bell was promptly anticipated the door opening before his finger could touch the button he checked momentarily in obvious surprise then jauntily lifted his hat as he stepped hurriedly inside why my dear he addressed the woman who held the door up so early i haven't been to bed of course mr arlington joan informed him well he observed not without envy you don't look it i've been packing all night she returned of course i can't stay here after what's happened of course not he agreed sympathetically having closed the outside door she moved before him into a small drawing-room which adjoined the entry hall on the left and when he had followed shut its door with particular care sarah's still packing she explained turning to arlington well he hesitated looking her over with a doubtful eye but she was at least outwardly quite cool and collected her manner exhibiting no undue amount of anxiety still a certain amount of make-believe would seem no more than decent look here he said almost sharply you're feeling all right eh quite only tired as a dog and naturally i understand he interrupted but you'll be fit to go on to-night you think don't worry about that joan advised him decidedly i'm hoping to get a nap before evening but even if i don't i know the first duty of an actress is always to her public yes arlington agreed briefly avoiding her eyes still i must ask you to be prepared joan's figure stiffened slightly and her dark eyes widened dead she questioned in a low voice arlington nodded i'm sorry about half an hour after we got him home the girl sat down suddenly and buried her face in her hands oh she cried in a stifled voice how awful there arlington moved over and rested a hand familiarly on her shoulder brace up you'll forget all about this before long oh no never she moaned through her fingers but you will he insisted looking down at her with an odd expression to begin with i'm going to make it my business to see that you forget you must you can't do justice to your genius if you keep harping on this accident it wasn't your fault you know just as soon as i've arranged a few details by the way how's the cardrow woman asleep joan answered she hasn't made a bit of trouble since the doctor gave her that dope whatever it was good he'll be along presently with a nurse he can trust and by that time i'll have you out of the way i know just the place for you a little flat uptown on fifty-ninth street overlooking the park you'll be very quiet and comfortable there and near the theatre besides i'm glad of that i was thinking of course i'd have to go to some hotel and i didn't want to and quite natural you want to be alone until you feel yourself again i'll find you a good maid and make everything smooth for you you're not to fret about anything and if you're troubled you must come right to me 
you're awfully kind don't look at it that way please how can i ever thank you oh we'll talk that over some other time arlington removed his hand from her shoulder and went back to the table upon which he had deposited a bundle of newspapers there's no doubt of your success he pursued soothingly your notices are the finest i've seen in years i brought you the lot of them in case you care joan uncovered her face and looked up quickly oh do let me see them arlington placed the papers in her eager hands they're all folded with your reviews uppermost oh thank you ever so much but in the act of opening the bundle joan hesitated and let it fall into her lap there's nothing about she questioned fearfully no and won't be he promised besides these were already on the presses by the time it happened you needn't worry he resumed moving to a window and looking abstractedly out hands clasped behind him the affair will be kept perfectly quiet everybody's been seen and fixed except the cargo and the doctor has already given us a certificate of death under the knife operation for appendicitis imperatively required at an hour's notice by the way i don't suppose you know but marbridge didn't leave any papers or anything of that sort lying round here did he there was no answer he heard a paper rustle and looking round saw the girl with her attention all absorbed by one of her notices well he said after a moment i'll go and have a talk with that maid sarah all right she returned abstractedly you're all ready to leave when i fix things up with her yes she returned without looking up he hesitated a moment by the door remarking the flush of colour that was deepening in her cheeks then with a mystified shake of his head he left the room very quietly she remained alone for upwards of half an hour in the course of which time she read all the reviews once and some of the more enthusiastic twice then carefully folding the papers she put them aside and sat thinking she thought for a long time without moving her eyes shining as they looked ahead out of the stupid and sordid turmoil of yesterday into the golden promise of to-morrow she thought by no means clearly with a brain confused by praise and sodden with fatigue but above the welter of her thoughts a single tremendous fact stood out solid and unshakable like a mountain towering about cloud-rack she was a success End of chapter thirty nine end of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance